Hey everyone, welcome to the Redefining HR podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Kathleen Hogan. Kathleen is the Chief People Officer at Microsoft, and we're going to get into so much from how she and her company is thinking about hybrid to innovation at scale and so much more. So <laughs> Kathleen, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Uh, I'd love to have you just open up with a, an introduction for the audience. Well, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, great to be here. Uh, so yes, I'm Kathleen Hogan. I lead HR at uh, Microsoft. I've been in role, goodness, eight years now. And uh, prior to that, I was leading our services organization. I've been with Microsoft since uh, 2004. Great. So you, I know you, you have a career path where you've had, you've been kind of a business operator, uh, as you mentioned, in a range of organizations, including Microsoft, before moving into the CHRO seat. And I'd love to get your perspective. Like, walk me through that transition. How, how did that kind of transition within Microsoft come to be for you? Yeah. So but prior to uh, leading HR, I was leading our consulting and our support organization, which is about 20,000 people at the time. That was uh, a while ago. And so I was implementing uh, and supporting the products that uh, the product teams built. And uh, Satya Nadella, who is now our CEO at the time, was running our server and tools business. And so we were partnering together in that capacity where he was building tools and I was trying to support and consult on on, on the products. Um, and then when he became CEO in 2014, I'm having to remember my dates now, uh, probably a couple months in, maybe it was three or four months in, he called and uh, and asked if I would help him come lead HR. And I'll never forget that moment because I had uh, decided to take a sabbatical. And so I was on a road trip with one sister to my other sister's birthday party. And her daughter was in the back seat and uh, listening to the Brady Bunch and Satya calls and calling. My sister's trying to get her daughter, Catherine, who was like four at the time, to be quiet. And um, But that's how I had that first initial conversation with Satya about uh, helping him come and lead HR. And, and as we furthered the discussion, he had a real sense very early on that he wanted to uh, transform the culture. And that would be one of his core priorities in his CEO leadership role. And it's interesting with your background as uh, as an operator and kind of on the commercial side of the business, how did that prepare you uh, as you moved into the CHRO seat? Because it's a, it used to be a fairly non-traditional, uh, non-linear career path, but right. these days we are seeing more of that, especially moving into the uh, HR executive role. And so how did that kind of give you a, a unique advantage, obviously also having worked with Satya, having the relationship in place? Right. Um, how did that cross over for you? Yeah, on one level, there was an advantage. And then there was a, on another level, a huge disadvantage where I was very grateful to have an incredible team uh, that I relied on and an incredible set of colleagues as I stepped into the HR function. But leading services, I always said, people are your product. You know, you're not selling cups and saucer, you're selling the expertise and the IP and the professionalism of the people. And so our strategy always was to attract, develop and retain, and retain exceptional talent. And my uh, HR partner was absolutely strategic. And so I always uh, saw how that role could make a huge difference from a people perspective, aligning your people agenda to your business agenda, having that be inextricably linked uh, and really using talent to change the trajectory of your business. So I think I came in with some of that. Um, I also had a background in consulting that in retrospect, I think served me well in terms of coming in and viewing everything as an opportunity to consult and bring people together versus owning it by myself. So the whole people agenda for the company has been owned by the SLT, and I viewed myself more as a consultant orchestrating that with Satya and the leadership team versus I own that by myself. So I think those have helped. But as I mentioned, I came in and I had just great, um, great team members who are experts in diversity and inclusion and comp and benefits, um, you know, and talent and learning and a lot of those areas that I had to ramp up on, and I'm I'm still ramping up on if you will, eight years later. You know, did anything surprise you kind of once you moved into um, stewardship and leadership of the people function? Obviously, you've been a, uh, a customer, if you will, of the HR team right. um, you know, throughout your career. Now you're on the other side. Uh, did you have any maybe perceptions of, you know, what that the function was like maybe from the customer side that shifted once you were kind of directly embedded and leading the function? 
Yeah, no, I, I, as I said, I had, I had a very positive view of HR coming in just because I really had such a strong partnership with my HR partners uh, when I was leading services and before, before that, when I was leading customer support. So I came in with that. Uh, you know, if I go back 20 years ago, if I think about perhaps Saturday Night Live skits, I mean, of course, there's, you know, sometimes that element of, of HR being perhaps unidimensional. Um, and I, I never viewed it that way, but I would say I have uh, come to appreciate how multidimensional and how many different ways the HR function can make a difference. And so that's been fun to, to grow in that uh, knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting that you, you use the term multidimensional because I think that uh, that is so apt for the function but the aptness of that term has, has, I feel, dramatically increased over the last couple of years. When you look at the, 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 the critical role of, of the people function leading the business through the, you know, the pandemic, the shift to remote, the different conversations we're having around racial equity and social justice, uh, hybrid mental health, you know, so many of these kind of macro topics for the people function, uh, and not just the people function, but for businesses broadly, has been evolving at a, at a very accelerated pace. And obviously in your role as CHRO, you're, you are leading um, from the front in all of that. And so I'd love to get your perspective. You know, you, you've been in that role at Microsoft for eight years now. So you, you've seen kind of, you know, perhaps what maybe what were somewhat more stable times prior to the pandemic and obviously what's dramatically changed since the pandemic. You've got a workforce of over 175,000 employees. How do you see kind of your role in helping navigate, you know, both the business uh, and the and the employees and the team, you know, through all of these events? Well, I think the role is, uh, on one level, how do I see my role? I see my role in some ways very, um, very focused on having a great employee experience and making sure, back to what I talked about before, the ability to attract, develop, and retain exceptional talent. But doing that in, in real partnership with the SLT, because if you look at what we've tried to, or what we've navigated, COVID, you know, trying to navigate COVID by, by any function by itself would have been foolish. We quickly got on a call and realized as an SLT, we started meeting daily to really navigate COVID, if you think about uh, addressing racial injustice, you know, we put together a plan that, of course, is focused on first having diversity and inclusion and representation within Microsoft. But then how do we use our platform with our suppliers? How do we use our platform from a policy perspective? What are different elements of that agenda that make it partially about HR? But ultimately, it's I, I think it's a shared responsibility with the SLT. So you know, maybe on that dimension, we still have to focus on world-class benefits. We still have to focus on recruiting. We still are focused on, um, you know, compensation, all those key elements. And I think more and more, we're part of these cross leadership um, teams trying to solve these um, challenges that really cut across the company and use all of our different functions to really um, serve our employees and, and to, to solve the problem, if you will. Yeah, and I mean it is interesting too because I think the obviously the your role as CHRO, the the people team's role broadly within the organization, you know, it is to support but also work in collaboration with the SLT and even with the the employees and the teams to support a lot of these initiatives. We'll help develop the frameworks, but you know, it's not a matter of HR necessarily owning all of these areas. And one of uh, those components, I think, gets us into hybrid, which I know it's a, a piece, a topic you've written a lot about. Um, you had a great piece, uh, I think, late last year around the importance of supporting managers to make hybrid work. And obviously, that's a skill set that, you know, managers who've historically have worked in co-located environments, you know, that doesn't just port, that skill doesn't port automatically to, to managing remote teams. And so it requires development. And I'd love to get your perspectives. When you think about the ingredients of, of getting hybrid right, since that seems to be a default operating model for many companies these days, what does that look like? How should companies be prioritizing kind of the different components of hybrid uh, in order to create a successful employee experience? We... Well, I certainly have a point of view now, but I'd also say I think there's going to be a lot that we're going to learn. And uh, that point of view, I, I assume, will continue to evolve just because I think we're in the throes of it. But I will say back in October of 2020, maybe six months into 
COVID, there was a huge push from certain folks to say, hey, come out with a thought leadership stance that says we're going to work from home forever, right? That if people want to, they have that ability. And I think part of that push was people making personal decisions and wanting that clarity and that definitive tops down support for that. But in my mind, uh, that wasn't going to be where we ended up. Uh, and I think we really stared at that and said, there's no way we're going to go back to the way it was. We broke open flexibility and, and it's really exciting. And yet, I don't think we want it to stay with this 100% remote, never being in person. There's a sense that po possibly, you know, we're on borrowed time in terms of leveraging our culture and all the things that we had invested in. But we were onboarding, you know, 15,000 people remote. I think you're, in the last two years, we've onboarded 60,000 people and who've never perhaps met their manager, never been in person. And so as we've thought about the uh, the hybrid model going forward, um, we've really thought about several things. One is having this growth mindset. You know, we've grounded our culture in a growth mindset, but this notion of constantly challenging your fixed mindset. I remember when we first said, um, we had a board meeting in March when COVID was start first hitting and we said, we're gonna work from home. And it's important that the entire leadership team work from home to role model because if we're gonna tell everybody to work from home, we've got to role model that. And I think at the time, if you had said to me, we're gonna do this for two years, you know, my fixed mindset would have said, there's no way. You know, we're not, we can't hire this many people remote. We can't onboard this many people without uh, ever being in person and yet somehow we've done it. So I think, it, it, you know, one of the things we've learned over the last two years is really challenging that fixed mindset, having that growth mindset. We really believe the role of the manager is gonna be key, you know, for us, Instead of coming out with a tops down, everybody can work from home or some sort of one dimensional mandate, we said it's going to depend. You know, we have certain folks that don't have the luxury of working from home. They're uh, on site. Uh, we have other roles that maybe you could be on site a couple days a week. Other roles, maybe you only have to be on site once a month. It really depends. And so we really said, let's empower each team to establish the team norms. Um, but try to provide as much flexibility as possible. You know, I think back when I was working 20 years ago, you know, the notion that I would have said, hey, could you just at least have all the meetings in the morning so I have flexibility in the afternoon? Or could you just schedule your meetings on Monday, Tuesday so that then I could work from home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? I mean, I can't, I couldn't imagine asking for that. But now I think people get to, and, and we should try to do that. Why not? Why wouldn't we try to provide as much flexibility as possible while still investing in those moments together when we do need to be together. So I think the role of the manager and those team norms is gonna be key. And then I think also the last piece of the puzzle, I think is employees, you know, as much as they're asking their managers and their teams to provide as much flexibility as possible, it's the other side of the equation where the employee is also saying, where do I need to compromise for the team, right? Because if everybody says, hey, I'm going to pick Monday not to work, I'm going to pick Tuesday, I'm going to pick Wednesday, and, and, and we can never get the team together. That's not the right thing for the team either. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, as you describe that, and I think about the, the complexity of, of, you know, your environment and the way that your team has to navigate things like flexibility across uh, an employee population of over 175,000, that's not uh, an insignificant uh, amount of variables to kind of be navigating. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, like how, how do you, when you think about innovation kind of on the people side of, of the programs that you're building and, and obviously, you know, Asatya bringing you in initially and, and tasked with the idea of like, let's just create a magical, uh, a fantastic employee experience. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you think about you know, innovating some of these programs at the scale that you operate? Like I'm just I'm fascinated to learn kind of how you whether it's you know hybrid workplace flexibility uh, could be four day work weeks. You know, there's so many different programs I think that are on the table right now as we're talking about designing this new world of work. Um, how do you think about you know navigating all those choices at the scale you operate? Well, certainly two things we've really focused on as anchors is our culture, you know, really defining our culture, and then also our mission. 
And so we talk about those as our bookends, you know, that mission and being really purpose driven and really being clear on the why, you know, why is why are people working at Microsoft, you know, and, and our mission is about empowering others. Um, and the how is via this culture, being a growth or having a growth mindset, being diverse and inclusive, showing up as one Microsoft, and then, you know, really being customer obsessed. And so we talk a lot about the um, the mission and the culture. But then since you asked the question, it's going to sound somewhat self-serving, but I think it's really true, is the other thing that's really empowering us, allowing us to be empowered at scale is our technology. And so really investing in you know, things like teams and our ability to have this hybrid work, you know, having world-class technology where some people can be in the room, some people can be remote, we're using uh, hands, we're using chat, we're using pull, pull, we're using all of these features so that uh, ideally everybody feels inclusive. And you know, we joked as an SLT, such as leadership team, that in the past, if you were remote, you had a terrible experience. You know, somebody was walking in front of the camera, you saw their backside. I mean, it was just not a great experience. We just weren't as aware, as empathetic, as intentional as I think the last two years hopefully have made us by all of us being remote. And hopefully we've all gained, I think, new, inclusive, good team hygiene meeting skills that the key now is to not lose those when everybody's remote, but take those forward and, and create something even better from a team management perspective when you're in hybrid. And so we believe it's culture, it's the mission, it's the people, but also we do believe that that technology uh, can really uh, empower those experiences. And that digital experience for our employees is as important now, in some cases, even more so than the physical experience, especially as more and more people uh, have that hybrid or fully remote experience. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. As you mentioned, we're still in early days here. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're still, you know, going to see how this plays out over the coming, you know, year and years. But I think one of the biggest shifts that um, we haven't even fully gone through yet that we're just beginning is is being much more um, deliberate around how we think about synchronous versus asynchronous work, especially in these new kind of digital and hybrid structures. So I think um, the companies that are really able to, to, to figure that out and kind of bake it into how they operate in their operating systems, um, I think are going to be such a, an advantage because they'll just, again, you, you kind of know when we're together, here's the things we focus on. When we're apart, it's time for deep work or whatever it might be. And it varies by role and team and, and organization, of course. Um, but it's going to be fascinating to see uh, how that plays out. And that's a you know probably a good transition to my next Question for you. You know, one of the things that I've I've appreciated that has been coming from your team over the last couple of years is the Work Lab initiative, um, and you know, a the level of um, you know data and metrics that are, and reports that are coming out of that group I think are fantastic, especially as it relates to uh, employee well being and wellness, hybrid, and just so many of these macro topics that we're we're all tackling in the field. Having that data that we can take back to our organizations to calibrate against. Um, I think it's been really helpful. Uh, and I think also within your team, you, you've opened up some of your own practices. And I think that that, that embrace of, of open source, um, building in public, working out loud, however you want to frame it, um, I think to me is one of the more transform, transformational things happening in the HR space is that we've really, you know, collectively we're moving away from those, um, you know, black box kind of siloed approaches towards uh, our practices and actually working in public and sharing. And so... I'd love to get your perspective. Why is that important to you? Why is it important for you to kind of, you know, open up some of your own practices on the people team um, for others to have a window into what you're building? I think that, I mean, certainly the last couple of years, there are certain things that really transcend competition, if you will. So if you think about COVID and when that was first hitting and thinking about how are we going to keep our employees safe? You know, I was on Maybe it wasn't daily, but feels like it was daily, but certainly weekly um, calls or email chats with the head of HR from Amazon, Facebook, Google, myself. We were collaborating on how we keep our employees safe. And, um, you know, that's just one example. You think about diversity and inclusion. I think we all want to make uh, tech much less, you know, broad uh, you know, the broad industry more diverse and inclusive. And so I think we've all shared a lot of our best practices so that we can all learn from each other on how to uh, create more diversity and inclusion within our companies. Even manager, right? We came up with uh, something we really love at Microsoft, which is our model for managers 
which is three things, model coach care. You know, the role of a manager is to role model the culture, role model our leadership principles. The role of the manager is to coach, not just inspect, but really coach and bring out the best in others. And then ultimately to care. You think about the last two years, really not being somebody's best friend, but caring to help somebody navigate working from home with kids at home or dealing with a um a loved one who was facing COVID or dealing with isolation because they had moved and joined Microsoft but couldn't come on campus. All those things that the manager played such a key role. We believe that that model coach care for our managers has made a huge difference for our employees. And why would we want that just to be for Microsoft? Why wouldn't we want everybody to have a great manager and to have those insights? So those are things where we're trying to, to give back and also recognizing that others share as well and we learn from others. You know, you talked in the beginning about coming into this role, not coming from HR. And of course I relied on my team, but I also relied on my peers. I had so many round tables and one-on-ones with my peers who shared freely that really helped me ramp. Um, and when I was facing different issues that I would reach out to and they'd give me their advice and I hope in turn have <laughs> returned the favor in some ways. But I think that's I think that's the spirit within the HR community. You know, certainly we compete for talent, but I think for all of us, there's a higher order agenda that we're also trying to drive that we want to collaborate and share. Um, so I think that's what's behind that. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm glad you touched on that network piece as well because I think to me um, they really go hand in hand, right? The 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 network equity and collaboration that's happening at a peer to peer level, particularly at the HR executive level. Uh, and then the open source practice sharing kind of up and down the HR teams. It allows us to innovate so much more quickly. Um, and I think, again, when you kind of compare that to more of the, you know, legacy proprietary mindset of HR's past, it's a huge shift from that. But it's also a huge catalyst to moving the entire field forward. So, um, yeah, definitely interesting to, to get your perspective there. And I think uh particularly at, at the peer sharing level, um, that's been instrumental uh, going through just the pandemic and I think so much of what we've experienced over the last couple of years. Well, and just if I may say one last thing on technology back to, you know, because you started uh, the thread uh, or that discussion with data. And I think we've really moved from, you know, just having data to really trying to take that data. And I've got this incredible HR BI team that uh, really helps turn that data into insights. But then what we're really trying to do is to how do you operational, institutionalize and operationalize those insights in the tool itself? Mm -hmm. So just you know, during the, here's one small example, but during the, the pandemic, we were looking at work-life balance going down and with everybody working remote, um, people just not having those breaks and the impact that was having on mental health. So we implemented um, commute time where you could block commute time. We implemented starting your meetings five minutes after the hour, just giving people that five minutes to, you know, catch a break. And those are um, those are small examples. But we're, what we're really trying to do is take the data from our employee listening systems coupled with our workplace analytics and really use the, those insights to then, you know, build ideas into the tool so that you're not having to teach everybody new things. It's just institutionalized in the tools that people use. And you think about learning assets and having those learning assets coming up within the workflow versus somebody having to know to go and get that, you know, reminding uh, managers so they don't have to do it themselves. The, the tool itself is reminding them on key things. So I think that's the other way we can, you know, democratize some of these learnings is in the tool itself. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned, um, you know, the ability to, you know, serve up kind of information when you need it, uh, learning in the flow of work, uh, as Josh Burson would say. I think when you look at your, a role like yours right now, and I don't mean yours specifically at Microsoft, but HR executives in general, there's so much that you need to be keeping a finger on the pulse of, um, both not just trends within the HR and people space, but business trends, societal trends, technology trends, uh, you know, the, the amount of, of data inputs that you need to be able to effectively lead the organization and keep your executive peers informed of how those may impact a business is vast. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, for you, how, how do you, what are your data inputs? How do you kind of keep, stay on top of the things that you need to stay on top of to be able to advise your SLT and kind of steer the business in the right direction? 
Uh, it's such a great question, and I'd love for you to give me advice on that, too, based on what I'm going to tell you. Uh, and the reality is there's many, many sources. I mean, as it relates to employee listening, now I'll talk internally versus then also externally, but we just have invested significantly in our employee listening systems, you know, the, the poll, the daily polls, various ways that we listen. Another key way is the um, our employee resource groups are just this incredible uh, listening system for us to really understand and, and uh, hear from our employees. Um, if you mean more, what, uh, how do I stay in touch in terms of what's going on in the world? You know, some of it is just, I have my, my Monday meetings with my leadership team, my Friday meeting with the SLT, learn a ton from that, learn a ton from just trying to go online and uh, using LinkedIn and seeing uh, what others are posting. And often that's just a great way for me to see content already curated by people that I'm following, which I find is a really effective way at, at uh, you know, finding content in a, in a more efficient way. I have to admit, PBS, one hour, that's a great way of just kind of getting the, the news hour. Uh, sometimes I do... Um, channel surf even, and look at what the various news stations are saying, just to get a sense of the spectrum of how uh, one topic can be viewed by different people. Let's just say that, to really understand the differing views that uh, our employees might have on any given topic. And then, of course, reading you know, HBR, Fast Company, uh, all of those sorts of uh, articles as well. But what do yeah. you do? Like, what's your secret to... Because some yeah. days it is, it's hard because I'll be in meetings all day and then, you know, somebody will say, did you see this? Or what about what's your, vo you know, what's your point of view on, on something that's just happened during the day and I haven't been online reading or uh, even aware? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, I think part, part of my role is uh, curating, right? And kind of in, in the media channels where I work and, you know, I write for Fast Company and other places. So, you know, part of my role is mm -hmm. to kind of constantly uh, try to wrap my arms around the fire hose of information and distill that down yeah. to things that are, are worth uh, the, the, the precious time and attention for people leaders. Um, so, you know, LinkedIn, a lot of the sources you mentioned, I'm on those as well. I found that Twitter... Uh, it can also be very hmm. helpful as an education platform. So I have different lists of, uh, you know, journalists or uh, analysts or different people who are authorities on different topics, and I organize them by lists. So I can easily kind of jump in, and if it's a particular topic that I want to know what, what's the latest of what's happening here, I can look on that topical list and kind of see what people are sharing, what they're talking about. Um, and that, I think, has been really helpful, particularly for, as you mentioned, kind of real-time news yeah. because I find that news tends to break on Twitter before anything else if you have it curated properly. That's good. Good advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, Kathleen, one last question for you before we jump into the lightning round. Um, you, you've kind of given us a window into some of the, the new world of work things that you're building at Microsoft. What gets you most excited when you think about this opportunity we have to really redesign work itself? Uh, what gets you most excited? What gets me most excited is the ability to tap into talent in ways um, that we, we couldn't have in the past and for talent to participate in the workforce that perhaps they wouldn't have been able to. Right? With this whole new hybrid, I think it's really going to open up. Um, I've already seen it opening up us uh, as Microsoft, but as my peers as well, our ability to get talent who perhaps you know, didn't want to move or couldn't work from, you know, or needed to work from home part of the time, but could come into the office part of the time. I mean, this huge flexibility that I think um, this new way of work is going to empower. I, what I get excited about is I think it's going to be a great experience for our employees to kind of manage work and life and and have much more um, fluidity and flexibility to 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 do both. But also, I think it's it's a huge opportunity for us to tap into talent in a way that we wouldn't have been able to in the past. So uh, that's I think it's really exciting. Yeah, well, it's an exciting time. And again, I appreciate all of your efforts, particularly on the open source uh, side of kind of sharing uh, what you're learning along the way. I know that uh, many of us will be continuing to follow that, follow that journey. Well, and by the way, thank you for what you do, because, you know, I'm just one person doing this podcast today, but all of the different people that you talk to, you know, allows all of us to listen and, and learn across the spectrum of people. So thanks for what you do uh, as well. 
Yeah, I, well, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to be able to help share some of these stories. And again, just uh, allow us all to kind of connect and learn from each other. Um, and now the audience is going to get to know you a little bit more in the lightning round to learn a bit about you outside of work. And so <laughs> lightning round, uh, quick way we wrap up every episode uh, just to allow the audience to get to know you a little bit better. And we start with music. Uh, I'm checking out your Spotify playlist or wherever you get your music from. Uh, who will I learn are your top three artists on rotation? <laughs> well, and here, if you really want to get to know me, the reality is I don't really listen to a lot of music. So that's just not a big focus. You know, I, I so if I'm honest, I don't have a top three. The only thing I could share is that when Meatloaf died recently, given I grew up uh, when he in my high school years was it was really big. I would say I, I sort of binged on on Meatloaf in the last couple of months. But uh, I don't really have a, a music pay playlist, if I'm honest. OK, well, Meatloaf left us a, a robust <laughs> catalog to uh, I know my team his, right uh, now is saying, oh, my goodness, could you not have at least come up with three, you know, hip <laughs> current people and just make it up and just say that you're listening to them. You know, to be honest, I kind of like that you're just riding with meatloaf. I'm, I'm I'll a, just start I, with I that. Appreciate that. And by the way, my son who just turned 20, you know, would have a much cooler playlist. And uh, no matter what I say, I know he would say it's a, uh, it's a little bit out of date. So. Uh, okay, we're going to shift from uh, music to television. Uh, what was the latest uh, binge watch or, uh, or, or show that you streamed on TV? Okay, that I I do like to watch TV as a way to uh, just check out. And I watched, um, it's with Will Ferrell and um, Paul Rudd. It's The Psychiatrist Next Door. I think that's the right yeah, title. Yeah. Have you heard of it? Yep. I have heard of it. I haven't seen it yet. But it, but I mean, how could it go wrong with those two? I, I had no idea what it was about. I just wanted something where, you know, you're on the treadmill and something for 30 minutes or 45 minute episode that would get you motivated. And so I started watching that and I really enjoyed it. I also loved Ozark. I binged watched on that this during COVID. Um, curb your, is curb good, your yes. enthusiasm. I'd never watched that, and uh, I read. I discovered Curb Your Enthusiasm, so watch that. I feel like that is an all star pandemic discovery because Curb, <laughs> curb Your Enthusiasm. There's a lot of uh, of good in that uh, in that whole catalog. Yeah. I mean, it's just Larry David is uh, he he could do no wrong. I think with those. Yeah. Um, if you weren't, uh, we're shifting careers. Uh, I know you've been in consulting, uh, you know, you, you've led service teams, obviously you lead the HR, HR function. Now you can no longer do any of those things and you have to do something new. Uh, what would it be? I'd love to teach math again. I taught math when I was in, um, college, that was my summer job. And, and I really love teaching math. And I taught, uh, math to my, uh, younger sister, you know, and she, I don't know if she liked it or not, but, you know, from an <laughs> early age, I, I, I always thought I wanted to be a teacher. And so that's what I would do. I'd go back and, and teach again. Yeah. And uh, Kathleen, last question for you. And an interesting question, because uh, you've actually been the answer to this question for several previous guests. But who is one HR leader who you admire and why? I admire Rhonda Morris, who is the CHRO of Chevron. Um, I just think she's authentic. I think she has great insight. Um, and she's just a great colleague. Uh, you know, sometimes she does the 911 and texts me and says, hey, I need help. But equally, when I do the same thing and want advice, um, she's there for me. And so I admire her both in terms of uh, a professional, but also as a colleague who um, has been just a great support. I could list a lot of people. I mean, honestly, I've met so many great CHROs. You're, you know, it's good that you're just asking me to pick one, and I feel bad even picking one, although uh, I absolutely stand by Rhonda. But I've had so many, so many of my, uh, my peers have helped me over the last eight years. I, I truly am grateful for that. Yeah, I do realize it's a very spot question because most people have more than one that they have tied. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm putting some constraints around you and, uh, <laughs> and I, I appreciate the feedback on Rhonda. So uh, Kathleen, thanks so much for making time. I know your schedule is very busy, so appreciate you making time to join the podcast and sharing some of, uh, of your journey and your work with the, uh, the listeners and myself. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to, great to be here with you today. <laughs> 